The following broadcast is a presentation of Mount Zion Media Ministries. Second Kings, Old Testament, chapter 8. Second Kings, chapter 8. And let's see. Then spake Elisha, or Elisha, depending on whether you're north or south. Then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise. And go thou and thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord had called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistine seven years. And it came to pass... At the, at the seven years in, that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Jehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha had done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king, how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Jehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elijah restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him, so the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the, land, of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. Let the church say amen. amen. And the message, the subject of the message today, I want it back. I want it back. And so you'll know that this is not just for me. I want you to repeat after me. I want, I want it, back. it back. Now I need you to say it with some attitude. You know, put your neck in it. Put your voice in it. <laughs> say it. Say it on your own with a little attitude. I got you. I got you. Father, thank you so much for this time that we have today in your word. And I pray that you guide us and lead us every step of the way. Daniel Simmons is no longer able to speak. I need you to speak through me today. I offer you this vessel as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in your sight. Speak to us and then give us an ear to hear and a heart to believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So here it is. Here it is. I want it back. In the Bible, God is on a mission in part for us to get to know him. And so when we look at the New Testament, the Bible tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. But then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And the person referred to there as Jesus Christ. And so Jesus came to reveal who God was to us so that we would know Him. God lived among us and left records for us through the life of Jesus to get to know the character and the capacity of God. And there's so much more, but it's those two things I want to focus on today, his character and his capacity. But before Jesus came in the Old Testament, God revealed him, himself through the interactions that he had with the people called Israel primarily, but some other nations in the Old Testament. And so when we read these stories 
of God interacting, God is trying to show us who he is because he wants us to know him and to know what his capacity is because in our relationship to benefit from everything that God brings to the table, we got to know him. And to know how to properly pray and, and interact with him, we got to know what his capacity is. And the Bible shows us to it. And so in this, in this wonderful portion of scripture today, um, the person we're looking at is Elisha, who is a prophet of God. And when you study his ministry, you see what a wonderful God he is. His name, Elisha, that E-L means God. In the issue in it, the I-S-H-A means salvation. And you put it together, and his name means God is salvation. Or God saves. And what God is trying to show us is, through the life of Elijah, as we get to know him in his capacity, how he saves people and how he cares about them. This is just a bonus. So one of the things that God reveals through Elijah is how equitable, how equal God is. Elijah, more than any of the other prophets, performs miracles, more than any other prophet, much like Jesus. And this is what his miracles show. They show us that God has an open door for all people. This woman's story, for example, that we're going to talk about in a minute, is in chapter 4. And the Bible says that she was a wealthy woman. She was rich. And God blessed her with things that her money couldn't buy. Because un unlike some people think, even people who got money can be blessed and have a relationship with God. But before the woman got her blessing, there's another woman who's a widow. Her husband was a prophet, a preacher, a pastor, and he died and the church didn't have a retirement program for, for her. And they had debt. And so the debtors came to collect their money. And she had no money. And so because of the current situation they lived in, the creditors could take her sons and make them slaves to work off the debt. So she cried out to the prophet of God. And God stepped in and blessed her with a, with a sudden supply of resources so that she could pay off her debt and then she and her son could have something to live on. So God says, whether you're poor or whether you're rich, it doesn't matter. I can still bless you. I bless the woman with what money couldn't buy. I bless the other woman with money to buy what she needed. Anybody. This same God, who was the God of Israel, most of his blessings was to Israel, but there was a foreigner as well. Um... You, you, you know him as Naaman, who, I mean, the, the fellow who had leprosy, Naaman the leper. God blessed him even though he was a foreigner. So God wants us to know that we need to be kind even to foreigners, even to immigrants, that we can bless them as well. And then God shows um, in his miracles through Elijah that he cares about all aspects of our lives, all aspects. The woman who didn't have a son, the, uh, the woman who couldn't pay her bills, but then there were some men who went to work. And one of them had a borrowed axe, and the head of the axe came off and fell in the water. And he cried to Elisha, my God, my, 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 my God, I borrowed that axe. I got to take it back. And he made the axe swim. He put a stick in the water, and that axe head started swimming and connected with that stick so it could be given back. And I say all that as a bonus in the sermon just to simply say, don't buy into the, the doctrine that God is only concerned about heaven and not what's on earth. There are some people, as you've heard me say, the only thing they got, got for you when they are talking to you about salvation is, do you know where, where you're going if you die and wake up in the morning? Do you know where your soul is going? That is important. But for God, where you lay your head tonight and where you wake up in the morning, that's important too. Having food on your table, having access to health care, being able to vote, being able to learn about your own self, that's important to God too. That's important. So now let me get to this message. And so this rich woman, 
name not even given to us because in God's mind, her name is not important. Her name might have messed some of you up because your name didn't match your name. You may have thought that the message and the blessing couldn't be yours. But, but this nameless woman who is blessed by God living in Israel, again, a wealthy woman, but then God speaks to Elisha and says, I am sending a famine to the land, and it's going to last for seven years. He instructs Elisha to tell the woman to leave her home, to leave all the land, everything that she has, to leave all of it behind, and go to whatever country she wants to go to where there is no famine, and I will take care of her there. And so she goes to Philistia in the land of the Philistines, and she stays there for seven years. The famine ends, and she comes back home. But here's the problem. She does not have a home to come back to because when she abandoned her house and all of her land and all of her resources to move to Philistia, the king, the kingdom, they had the right to confiscate the land. And either the government could farm it and work it and, and take advantage of it and everything that it produced, or it could be sold or leased to somebody else. But it appears that in this case, the government decided to keep the land and they were benefiting from it while she was gone. So she came back, but she had no land. She had no resources, she had no wealth, but she wanted it back. And so, it appears, based on this story, that her husband may be dead, because usually the man would go and make the request, but in this case, this woman makes up her mind to go to the king and make an appeal, to make an appeal to the king to give me my life, my land back. Again, this Bible is instructive, teaching us about God. And there are two things that happen, even three things, but I want to show you the two first that happened to her, and the third is for me and for you. And here is what, what happens. While the woman is making up her mind to go and talk to the king, and make her appeal, it says she's going to cry out, she's going to plead, she's going to pray for him to give her her land back. While she is preparing that, look at what God is doing. Because God is who he is, the character of God. He loves this woman. He cares about her, her every need, and he's the one who sent her away to keep her in the famine, and now he has already made up his mind that I'm going to take care of this woman because I care for her, I love her, that's who I am, and I have the capacity to give her back what was hers. And so how does God do it? Here it is, number one. Before the woman gets to the room, God already has her in a conversation in the room where she is not yet. Let me, I know that you didn't get that because the grammar is not right. God has her in a conversation in a room where she is not yet. She has to get in that room, but she's not there yet. And God knows that she needs to be in that room. And God knows what needs to happen when she gets in that room. And so God puts her on the lips of the folk in the room who gonna have the capacity through God to give her what she wants. God puts her on the lips and the hearts of the people in the room where she is not yet. She thinks she's going in the room by herself. She thinks she's going in the room and there has been no preparation in the room for her. But God is ahead of her in the room where she is not yet. See if I can rewind this for you. There are some rooms that you are not yet in 
But to get what God has for you, you got to go in that room. And, and without you knowing it, God already has people talking about you in the room where you don't even know you're going yet. God already has you on their lips and in their hearts preparing them for your arrival. And you scared to go. You scared to move. Because you figured out how you're going to do it, what you're going to say, what all of that is. And they don't know you, and I ain't got this, and I ain't got that. But God has already put you in the room through other conversations. Because the Bible says that when she got there, Elisha was talking because God put it on the king to ask Elijah's servant, Jehazi, that's who he was. He was his servant. All the miracles he did, he, uh, he saw them firsthand. And, and the king now, who, who previously hated Elisha, now he has an interest in what he did. And so he says, tell me about all these miracles that the king did. And then he's telling him about all the miracles, and he did a lot of them more than any other prophet. But, but look at God's timing. After he tells them about the woman, the woman shows up. You can't beat God's timing. And then the king says to, to Jehazi, I don't want to hear this story from you. Let me hear it from her. Let me, let me just say one other thing before I leave this point about putting you in rooms that you are not yet. You know what some of your problem is? You are focusing on the wrong conversation. You are concerned about conversations in room by your haters. You're running around here worried about what folks saying about you. And, and, and you got friends who, 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 you know, so-and-so, so-and-so. And so that's where your energy, that's where your focus is, in those negative com conversations. Come close to me. Stop giving your attention and your energy. Stop tracking down what folks say. And take God at his word. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And instead of chasing those conversations, be still and listen to God and see what room God is trying to take you through to so that you can hear and be a part of those conversations you need to be a part of. So the woman... The woman who goes there, she has her plan together. I got my story. I'm going to tell him I want my land back. I got 20 acres in this plat. I got 30 acres over here. And I had this, this olive grove. And, and, and I had this, this wheat field. And I had a house. And, and, and blah, 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 blah. He said, I, I, I don't want to hear what you had. Tell me your story. What I want you to see, and I, and I told you last um, week, your history is preparation for the room God is taking you to. Your H-I-S-T-O-R-O-Y, his story. It's you in his story that's preparing you for the room or the rooms he's going to take you into. And all you got to do is understand that if you listen, not, not to that foolishness, but listening to him, when you get in the room, he'll, he'll have you prepared for what you need to say. This woman's history was what sold the king. Tell me, what did the man of God do for you? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Shunammite woman. And it's in the fourth chapter, y'all, listen to me. I was married to an old man. And that old man took good care of me. I was wealthy. We were wealthy. And I saw this man of God coming by my house, traveling to and fro. And because I recognized him as a man of God, I stopped and offered him something to eat, something to drink. And he kept coming, and I realized, again, just how, how much of a man of God this man was. And I wanted to help him, so I went to my husband and said, let's build him a room on top of our house. And let's put him a bed, a chair, a candle, a table to read and study 
and somewhere for his servant. Let's fix it up for him. And, and every time he come by, he'll have somewhere to stay. And so the husband agreed and she fixed it up for him. And every time he came by, she would take care of him. And then he sent Jehazi out, go say to the woman, because you've been good to us. What can I do for you? Do you need me to appeal to the king on your behalf? Do you need me to do something for you? She said, no, I am fine. Every need I got has been taken care of. I'm fine. The Lord has taken good care of me. But then Elisha was not satisfied. He said to his servant, let's, let's think about this thing now. What is it that she don't have that I can give her? Jehazi, I said, well, she don't have any children. And her husband is old. He ain't hit no much. <laughs> but she's still young. And um, Elisha said, tell her to come here. He said, this time next year, I'm coming by here, and you're going to be rocking a baby. She says, and she's a sister, y'all. She snatched it, don't play with me. I'm satisfied. I've settled into the fact that I can't have children. And I love my husband. And don't, don't, don't talk to me about tipping out, trying to do anything else, because I love that man. He's taking care of me. And, and so don't, don't play with me now. So now, 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 if you can deliver on this baby, fine, but don't play with me. And he assures her, I'm not playing with you. This time next year, you're going to be rocking a baby. And sure enough, God revived that old man, revived her, and they messed around and hooked up, and she got pregnant. Give glory to God for the old men. Come on, old men. Ah. Don't tell me what God can't do now. And so it is. So, and, uh, and so she has the baby. And the boy grows to a teenager. And then he's in the field working with his daddy. And the boy starts complaining to his daddy, my head, my head hurts. He tells the servant in the field, take the boy to his mama. The mama gets him and put him on her knee and she's comforting him and, and, and trying, to, trying to bring support to him while his head is hurting. And, and about noon, while he's on her knees, the boy dies. And she takes that boy upstairs to the room that she had prepared for the man of God and lays him on the bed of the man of God. Uh, I wasn't going to say this, but I, I, I need to go ahead and say it. Some of you will never get that kind of blessing because you, you can't bless the man of God. That's all I'm going to say right there about that. And, and so she lays him on the bed, sends word to her husband, send one of the young men from the field and tell him to get me a donkey. I'm going to see the prophet. He said, why are you going to see the prophet? It ain't a new moon. It ain't the Sabbath. That's when you normally go, don't worry about that. I got it. I need to go see him. He sends her and, and, and the servant, and they ride. And she said, now you ride, and don't you slack up unless I tell you. And so she goes to the house, and, th and this is what she's telling the king. And so I get there, and, and, and Elisha sees me before I'm coming, and he sends Jehazi to ask me, is everything all right? And she said, all is well. And then she gets there and tells him, my son is dead. And Elisha says to his servant, Jehazi, I take my staff and lay it on the boy. He'll come back. She said, no, 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 no. I don't want your servant and your staff. I need you. I need you. Listen at that mama. You going to my house. And so Elisha follows her to the house. And sure enough, Jehazi goes ahead of them. He lays the staff on the boy, but the boy doesn't move. He's still dead. He let, he, Elisha, Elisha gets there. He said, Mama, I got this. He goes up in the room, checks, showing up the boy is dead. He stretches himself over the boy. Chest to chest, breast to breast, mouth to mouth. <laughs> and the boy revived just a little bit. So he walks around the room, has a little talk with God, and he, he lays over him again, same way. This time the boy wakes up and sneezes seven times. He raises the boy from the dead, and mama got a boy back. 
And so now, he says, King, that's, that's what he did for me. He gave me a son two times. And now I've come back and I got my son, and this is living proof. This is, this is the boy who was dead, but it is alive because of Elisha. And so God prepared her through her story. And I want to tell you, whatever you are going through now in his story, don't, don't beat yourself up. Don't, don't, don't forsake God. Just, just know that part of this story that you're in right now is God's preparation to bless you in the future. And you just, again, like I said last week, you got to settle down and learn what God is trying to teach you in the season that you're in. And this is what I want to say for us thirdly, that watch what God did. He restored more than what she asked for. All she wanted was a land bank. But the king was so moved by the story, he said to her and to, to everybody in the room, listen, go get me an officer, and I'm going to appoint him to, this, to her case. I want you to give her land back. I want to talk about the fruit, and this is what, what that means. I want you to calculate all of the money that's been made off the land since she been gone. I want you to calculate the appreciation and the value of the land since she been going, gone, and then I want you to cut her a check for all of the increase in the land since she left. You ought to put your hands together right there. Because sometimes we don't ask for enough. But even when we fall short in our asking, God is able to restore whatever, whatever it is we lost. I'm almost through now, but I came here on an assignment today because my Bible tells me that God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. And my Bible tells me that God had not lost any power. That whatever God did back then, God can do it again. And my ancestors in the church I grew up in used to saying, it's no secret what God can do. What he done for others, he'll do for you. And I just believe standing here today in my assignment that God wants to restore some stuff. God wants to give some stuff back. But you got to want it. You got to ask for it. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Yeah, there's, there's some stuff you lost. And I come by to tell you today, you're authorized to get it back. Thanks for watching. Be blessed and continue walking in the light.